Good afternoon and welcome. I have with me journalist, author and adventurer Tim Butcher. Hi Tim. Hi. Tim, what do you prefer, author and adventurer? Well, can't, can't we sort of blend, blend the two? Isn't it always a bit of an adventure to try and write a book? And isn't uh, any person who goes on a journey going to write a, a diary or a memoir or even a postcard? So I suppose we straddle the world, straddle those two different terms. But your books are very much about adventure, or your personal adventures. Yes, well, I've done two books, uh, both in Africa, and they're really, uh, they're really journeys of discovery, really. Uh, they're trying to allow me to go and better understand complicated places, because Africa is what it is, which is a rich and wonderful place, but there are some great challenges here. One of the challenges I find, it's almost like a subconscious challenge, is, is the Congo. Just that name alone connects with some strange part of Ukraine. Uh, it has very powerful associations, and uh, I used the journey that I made through the Congo to better understand it. And yes, it was adventurous, because you're dealing with the Congo, you're dealing with a country where the most intelligent and uh, most reliable estimate says that today 1,500 people have died there because of a war. 1,500 died yesterday, 1,500 will die tomorrow. It's the most violent place on the planet, the instability in the Congo. But just, just talking about that, you did your exploration for the book in 2004. Yes, this is some years ago now. The book was published in 2007, 2008. Do you think in that time, in the nine years, the situation has improved in the Congo? Stayed the same or it's got worse? I'm going to hedge and say it's either stayed the same or got worse. It certainly hasn't got better. I mean, we're talking about a country which is, is frankly the, the greatest, the largest failed state in the world. It's very, very big physically from one side to the other. It's from London to Moscow. It's huge, great little lump of Africa. Sits astride the equator. Basically, you could take India and put India, the subcontinent, and that would basically be the area that is drained by one river, the Congo River. So it's, it's a very, very big place, and yet nothing works there. I mean, that's what we've got. It's nothing really functions there. You can't, they don't have a national police force that's worthy of the name. They don't even have an army that's worthy of the name. They have a UN force to keep it up. You can't post a letter there. There are customs that aren't national, there aren't even, there's not even a road network. It's a very broken, broken place. And I say that because I keep in touch with it, even though the journey I did was 2004, I'm still very, very keen on keeping in touch with people who travel through, and the few people who have done similar journeys since have uh, made it my business to, to contact them, to just to, to gauge how it's, how it's changed. But that's the beauty of it. You know, the adventure of travel in Africa is that it allows you to learn wonderful things, um, to better know places and to better know in a way yourself because you get to go and do things. I found Africa kind of holds a, a mirror up to us and you go to somewhere like Congo and you see all of the challenges that we see in our lives but it's sort of extenuated and magnified and that's why I find it quite adventurous. One of the conclusions which one comes out of what one read it is that the situation when, when Stanley did the exploration in the 19th century the situation now is more dangerous than when you did it. Yeah, well, the, the, the premise of the book is that we had a place which was closed to the outside world. Clearly, obviously, people lived there. It was closed to the outsiders until one of those 19th century explorers, in this case, a nuggety little Welshman, Henry Morton Stanley, goes there in the 1870s. It takes three years to get across this vast piece of real estate. And um, he changes so much because he, he's the first white outsider. He starts the scramble for Africa, because as a result of discovering the Congo River, suddenly the centre of Africa is game on. Suddenly, European powers want to grab uh, the African interior. So it's a massively important moment for modern Africa. And yes, it was dangerous for him, but uh, the dangers today are slightly different, because, of course, the, the people you're, who are fighting on the ground are not armed with what they were armed with in the 19th century. They're armed with Kalashnikovs today. Uh, there's a much more degree of, great, great degree of violence and lawlessness than there was then. Um, one thing that is different, of course, is that he, when he was traveling in the 19th century, he had no modern health care. He had no antibiotics. Uh, I could travel, and that was uh, uh, much, much, safe, much, much more safe for me. But in some ways, it's more difficult. But it, I don't think it's fair to compare. You are comparing apples and oranges. A 19th century journey with a 21st century. But what is so remarkable is that the real people, the people who lived in the Congo, had lived on this, even though they were too different time zones, two different scenarios, they're still there and they're still trapped in this amazing reality. But the reality of the situation is, even with modern healthcare of 2013 or 2004 when you did the trip, if you were really ill or you had a bad accident in the middle of the areas you were going through, 
was little chance of you getting the airlifted out or of being treated. Well, airlift, you say airlift, you think airlift, you can get helicopters into anywhere in the world, but there are large tracks that come, you can't get a helicopter. Beyond range, there are no strips, there are no, no fuel, you can't do, there are no helicopters physically. There are no, a few helicopters in the capital city in Kinshasa, a few in Kisangani, and some of the mines only in Katanga. But that's like saying there are six helicopters in all of Europe. I mean, it's such a big piece of real estate. So that's why I love the journey. I loved it because I was in a sense in the 21st century of going off the map, you know, going to a place which genuinely there was no. No number to call. There's no back phone. Oh, come and get me. There were places where I was on the Upper Congo River where I felt as isolated and lonely as if I was sort of on the South Pole, but there you are in the Central Africa. And that's the drama of it. How can a place in the middle of a continent be so disconnected? One of the comments in the book was that you couldn't get any insurance. No one would insure you for lawyers. Would you get insurance now? I don't know. Um, when I, uh, my second trip, which is a few years later, it's five years after this trip effectively, I went to Sierra Leone and Liberia in West Africa, both places troubled by wars, not on the same scale as the Congo, and wars that have genuinely finished. I mean, genuine, these are countries that are at peace, whereas the Congo can, remains uh, in, in combat in some areas. So this was a different place, and I was able to find a, in Britain, as, as you know, the Lloyds Insurance Brokers, there are some funny underwriters there, and they'll underwrite just about anything if you give them enough money. Including yourself. And in this case, I got a, a, a policy for myself. It cost an arm and a leg, typical for Lloyds. And uh, the idea was they would replace my arm or my leg if it got blown off or cut off or fell off. Um, in in whatever, Sierra Leone. In, in Sierra Leone, Liberia. Um, I don't know about the DRC. I guess I never asked them because when I, when I did that trip, it was, it was just it was impossible. Um, in, in 2004, I guess you might find some risk tolerant person, but I don't know if one, one thing that is certain is that you did get insurance, it would cost you many arms and many legs. Okay. Talking about moving on to chasing the devil, uh, this was a recreation or uh, retracing the steps of Graham Greene in Sierra Leone for his book Journey About Maps. Now, what prompted you to get onto that topic or that subject? Well, these are, again, as I said about the Congo, the Congo connects. It's a challenging place. It's difficult. And I've been to the Congo as a journalist and got frightened, basically frightened. I mean, terrified and perplexed. So I wanted to go back and better understand it. Same thing here. Sierra Leone, Liberia, I went there in the, uh, during the wars in both of those countries. Friends of mine were killed in Sierra Leone. In Liberia, I had a death threat put on me by the then warlord president, Charles Taylor. And I kind of scuttled away. And it was, it was very depressing to feel as if you couldn't understand the place or to know it because it's too complicated, too opaque. And you know, remember, we're in, the, we're in the 21st century, we're in the era of Wikipedia, of answers for everything. Google any answer. You know, in the 21st century, they'll pass the Sierra Leone and Liberia, which we literally off the map. So I wanted to go back to better understand. That's the premise of these journeys, using a journey to better understand. And in the case of uh, West Africa, I found that Graham Greene had made the perfect journey. He did it in the 1930s and he went bush. When he was a young man then, he hadn't really uh, written anything that was uh, particularly successful at that point. His later books obviously made him a household name, one of the great figures of English 20th century literature. But in 1935, he went off to challenge himself in Liberia, uh, mainly because he wanted to die. He had this sort of young adolescent death wish, He'd come close to death to feel coming and to feel more alive. That was the premise. And he did a journey. So that, the idea was, I'll follow what uh, the route that he took compare what he describes in his writing. He also took a female cousin, which is very typical of Green, always have women around him, but female cousin. She wrote something, so I have, some, I have something. Their notes, their observations from the 1930s, and that would allow me, that would give me, as it were, a, a fixed point against which I could then compare what I find today as a sort of compare and contrast exercise. So follow their route with their observations and see what has survived, what has changed, and what is the same. Is that the reason why you took a companion on this trip and not on the Congo? Uh, yeah, well, to be honest, in the Congo, no one, I couldn't find, I couldn't bring it in myself. First of all, I couldn't find anyone who would volunteer to come. And secondly, I didn't really want to try and persuade anyone to come because it was just off the graph, off the graph in terms of risk. For West Africa, it wasn't so risky. Uh, at peace, smaller country, uh, we're, going to be talk, we're going to be walking for about 600 kilometers, about 350 miles, it's more physical. Um, this was sort of scuttling along on little motorbikes and canoes and pillogs and um, uh, riverboats when you could. This was going to be a more, I, I thought, physically challenging. 
And, and yes, I frankly wanted some company. And uh, Graham Greene took his female cousin. I tried to get a female cousin, but none of my gorgeous female cousins would come. They all said, no way, you, you can do stupid things in Africa and Congo, we're not remotely interested in that. So I ended up dragging a, uh, a, a British guy who came, and he was my, uh, my female cousin, as it were. A useful guy, very useful, because his father is um, very well connected on the security side. His father would be the British High Commissioner in one of the two countries, the Syria, and that had allowed me, so not the flag, which had been a defense attaché. And that allowed me some sort of peace of mind. If I needed someone to come and get us out of the bush, if I took the youngest son of this well-connected guy, he would uh, that'd be a good device to get the so cavalry. A useful hostage, perhaps. Yeah, just a useful. And he was, if okay, what way were you going to persuade the cavalry to come and collect you? I know, take the youngest son and the person who's in charge of the cavalry, that would be a good option. Good stuff. Now, Congo, Sierra Leone, where to next in Africa? Well, in Africa, the trip I wanted to do was, was overland from Ethiopia into Somalia. Uh, there's a, a Second World War um, uh, period and journey there, which is what works for me in terms of history. But that's too desperate, too, too dangerous at the moment. So I have, um, I've done a journey in an African part of Europe, the most African part of Europe, you could imagine, which is the Balkans. And the journey I've done there, which I'm writing up now, is the life journey of the young man who triggers the First World War. It was a young Bosnian. He walked right across Bosnia, going from his little rural homestead where he was born, and was schooled, educated, and then radicalized, and ends up having gone overland, always to Bosnia, and then to Belgrade. He eventually comes to Sarajevo. You talk about Gabriel Prince? Indeed, I am. I'm talking about a young man called Gabriel. Gavrilo is the celebration for Gabriel. Gabrilo Prince. And uh, he, has, he covers an amazing sway of territory in his life journey. He packs it in, actually, because he's only 19 when he pulls the trigger, so he's only a teenager. Uh, and last year I walked for, for that distance, it was about 300 odd kilometers through Bosnia and uh, uh, Serbia. And it was rather fantastic actually to get through a country which wasn't quite as... It had different challenges to Africa. There were shops there, you see. In Bosnia you can find shops. There are rows of tar and functioning things, which is quite a different from, quite a difference from the Congo and from Liberia. But at the same time, it's, it touches on the same beauties of these of challenges of these journeys which is that you're going to difficult places to better understand complicated history. And you do that through the device of a journey. How long did I take Two months, two months. Took many more months to research and to understand. And remember that the Balkans, um, a little bit like these two places, I had, I had history, I had issues with the Balkans. In the 1990s, I'd been there as a journalist when the Balkans were ripping themselves to pieces. And as a Brit who now lives in South Africa, I'm so tired and fed up with that. Oh, it's only in Africa that you have tribal warfare. Only in Africa you see this. Well, let me tell you where I saw the worst tribal warfare in my life. And that was white Europeans cutting each other's throats. And that was in Bosnia. Bosnian Muslims, Bosnian Croats, and Bosnian Serbs slaughtering each other between 1992 and 1995. I was there as a young man, and it was thrilling and exciting, but also a little bit exasperating. She just, just couldn't make sense of this madness. And uh, the journey, again, is, is a beautiful element to that because I could use that journey to, to better understand what happened in the 90s because history has a funny old way, especially in parts of Europe, but particularly in the Balkans, it has a, a way of tripping over itself. You get to the same piece of real estate and history is doing epic things there. So in 1914, the world almost cuts its own throat because of the Balkans. And in the 1940s, exactly the same thing, the Second World War drama, Tito running around the mountains of Yugoslavia, Fitzroy McLean, a British officer coming in, the Cold War starting there. You know, when Churchill says, Look, an iron curtain has descended from Strieta to the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, he's talking about Trieste in Yugoslavia. This is the same place. And then in the 1990s, what happens? NATO learns to fight in the 1990s. And it's rather important today, because as a result of its willingness to deploy and fight in Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia. Guess where it has spent the last 10 years? In Afghanistan and elsewhere. So in terms of history, it's an epic piece of real estate. Incredible things happen there, but they're tough to understand. They're tough. When I say Balkans, people go, oh, complicated. Byzantine Empire, Ottoman Empire, Austro-Hungarians, history this, history the other, irredentism, separation, nationalism. It's complicated. No two ways about it. But the beauty of it, if you take the footsteps of a young assassin, it makes it very simple. What makes him so angry? What's he pissed off about? What's he seeking? What perceived injustice is he seeking to put right? 
and why when he pulls a trigger on the Archduke because that's spin out of control and spool into a First World War and my great uncle dies and yours and your viewers. Everyone's life in the Western world was impacted and shaped by the First World War. But it all starts with a 19-year-old Bosnian boy. It sounds absolutely fascinating. When shall we read about it? 100th anniversary of the First World War. It's a pretty tight timeline. We know the war started in 1914. That means the book's got to be written and ready by 2014. So, before should, August. Yeah, before August. It'll be happening, inshallah, it'll be out in the spring of 2014. Uh, I sit here in Cape Town all unshaven and haggard because I'm sitting against my deadline now and I'm writing my fury. I've been at it for about nine months. Okay. Now, completely changing the subject. And one of the part of the research I did for this interview was that uh, you have apparently become a standard text for AS level in England. Does that please you as a living author to become a standard text? Absolutely. Let me just to clarify, um, uh, the book that is used as a text is this one, Blood River, okay. and it touches on the Congo. And the reason I guess it works is we have such a powerful piece of writing about the Congo already out there, which is that that title that hangs over the Congo when you can't even talk about it. Surprised you haven't even asked your questions in its terms, because people always say Congo, heart of darkness born of the great novel, the great late 19th century novel by the Polish writer who changed, who anglicized his name to Joseph Conrad and wrote in English. He writes this novel, Heart of Darkness. And in counterpoint, my book, Blood River, is used as a, as, a, as a comparator. His view from the late 19th century, Butch's view from the 21st century. Have they, if you put the two together, do they merge or do they blur? Uh, and uh, what an honor, what an honor for any author to be even mentioned in the same breath as Joseph Conrad. So I'm hugely honored and very amused because, of course, in the modern multimedia age where people can blog and people can get up to date, you can, um, you can watch, you can see traffic, you can see teenagers having conversations online, of course, because it's on Twitter feeds and, and Facebook. And I had one the other day with someone slacking me off for ruining their teenage weekend or holiday because that's this idiot butch has written a book that I've got to do for A-level. Who gives a damn about the Congo? I'd rather kill this boy, kill this author, Tim Butcher. And then he called me hashtag prick, which I thought was very, if you know how Twitter works, I'm now known as hashtag prick. Which made me, uh, which made me um, rather amused. Oh, very complimentary. <laughs> Now, Tim, you live down here in Cape Town, right down here in the Tulsa Bay Coast. Yeah. Was that a matter of choice? You just loved it down here, or did you just want to be connected to Africa in some way? Well, I came to Africa 13, 14 years ago, and as many people do, many outsiders do when they come to Africa, and it is a big old place, so it covers a huge piece of, huge swathe of territory, but there's uh, some people feel a strange sense of connection, and I certainly did, and I, I just felt, felt that power. Um, it's, it's not always a good power, sometimes it's an, an ominous power, sometimes it's a portent, but I just love the energy about, about Africa, the sense of potential. There's a sort of equilibrium, we're in South Africa, we're, we're in a state in a country at, at peace, it is an equilibrium, but it's a rather exciting equilibrium. And I think it's like this equilibrium of a rugby ball, instead of the European country, which is a rugby ball in equilibrium, sitting on its side, you know, you nudge it and it just rolls back and forth. This is a rugby ball here in Africa, tipped with its balance on its end. It's standing still, but if you touch it, it can swing all over the place and deep topple over. So I, I just love it for its energy and its um, uh, potential. You can do exciting things here. And um, when I came here, I made a connection that I've never really wanted to leave. I, this, these, these books have drawn me back here, and I, I came to live here permanently with my children a few years ago. And uh, it's the, the best choice I've ever made. But why here in Cape Town? Why not perhaps more in Zululand or some other more African place as opposed to the Europeanized Cape Town? Well, I guess you're right that Cape Town isn't the most indicative or uh, typically indicative of African city, but in a way that's what I rather like about it. It's a port city. People come, they go. It's a place in transition. It feels a bit like a sump at the bottom of an engine where all the interest because the engine fall off, they always end up in Cape Town. You meet criminals and the dispossessed and the creative and the weird and the wonderful down here. You just meet travellers, people who are of similar spirit to me. And I like it, I like it for that reason. And uh, it's, uh, it's a very, uh, it is a, to quote the, uh, to use a, or to, to bastardise a quote of one of Cape Town's um, more famous residents, it's a rainbow city. Touches on it all sorts here, and uh, I like its energy and its its natural beauty and its sense of connection because 
I can connect to a desert in that direction, or to a seashore in that selection, or to uh, mountains in that direction, or to a different coastline in that direction. It, it's, it's an amazing launch pad, and uh, for two with two young children, it uh, ticks my boxes. It's the place to live. Do you travel much in the country with your children, with your family? Yes and no. Um, not as much as I'd like to. They're young, uh, five and seven. When we in Cape Town, oddly enough, just this area alone, this. You drive four hours out of town, five hours out of town, eight hours out of town. You can find different channels, wonderful and exciting and rewarding things. The Cedarburg Mountains, which are just up the road here, which are an extraordinary range of mountains where children can have rivers to swim in and fish in, rocks to clamber in, caves to get lost in, all those sorts of things. You can swing in that direction and do something totally different involving a desert in the Karoo. Swing further along, you can get further along. Like I said, um, I've got to know South Africa very well. I love travel, uh, but with the kids of this age, you have to, I'm not quite as peripatetic as uh, I might always uh, might want to be. Aren't we all in that situation? Uh, on a different note, what do you think of the political situation here in South Africa? Again, it's the rugby ball on its tip. It's exciting, um, it's different. And I tell you what, it's, I think it's the most dynamic time in South Africa for the last 20 years. Um, after the 94 election and the end of white rule and the election of an ANC government, of an African National Congress government, Basically, we've been in a honeymoon period. This has been honeymoon. The ANC is unchallengeable. Like all African independence movements, they get 15 to 25 years grace. It's happened in Kenya, happened in Zimbabwe, happened all over the Zambia. It replicates. You get well done for winning independence, you get 20 years of grace. And then, and then. And you don't really get to know the color of a political party, whether it's Kano in Kenya or or uh, uh, Zanu in uh, Zimbabwe or others. You don't get to know until they are challenged politically. And the African National Congress has not been challenged politically since that before. So powerful is that whole in Parliament. And yet it's dripping and it's clipping away. I mean, local elections, you have the opposition who are getting 24, 25% of the vote. And that's a very, very, very significant change from 8% and 12%. And they're doubling their numbers. They've got a long way to go, but. For me, the, we don't know what the ANC is really all about. We truly don't know because they haven't left that in that period. And that's what so makes it exciting. Um, Desmond Tutu, I just mentioned him in terms of rainbow. He is a man who has announced in the last few weeks that he would no longer vote for the party that brought liberation to this country. He is so fed up with the African National Congress for the corruption, for the taking of money, for the lining of nests, for the cronyism for the pure criminality of, of not allocating contracts in the fair way but only to their credit their friends. And, and Desmond Tutu, as a, almost as the national conscience of South Africa, he dares to say something which is remarkable, that I've had it with the ANC, I will not be giving them my cross on a bit of paper. And that is purported, that, that promise is exciting times. We have Steve Biko's wife, Steve Biko, who was killed in the 1970s. His wife has just announced a, an opposition party because of course the problem in this country is who are the opposition, what is the opposition? And it's been articulated as so much in South Africa along the black-white axis. So the opposition has been a predominantly white party. It's not a white party, it's called the Democratic Alliance today, it's been through various iterations. Uh, it's not a white party, but it's perceived to be a white party. And that's perception, is, is, is what's key in politics. So we now have um, a, a party run by, by uh, Manpele Rebele, who is the wife of, uh, of a widow of a former partner of Steve Biko. And she opens up a new form, and she could take ANC votes. So, a long answer to a short question. Um, what's the political situation like in South Africa? It's in flux, is what I'd say, and flux is interesting. Well, I think we all look forward to a change. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, on that note, good luck with your book. I hope it gets out before to August 2014. Thank you. And thank you for speaking with you at My pleasure to speak to you at Okay. Thanks, Tim.